Part 1. You will hear a conversation between an officer of the Small Claims Tribunal and a consumer who wants to make a claim. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'd like to lodge a claim. Certainly. Name? Emily Jane Appleby. Appleby? That's an unusual name. Sorry, what did you say your first name was again? Emily Jane. Now, Miss Appleton, could you please fill in this claim form? I've never done that before. Can you help me? Yes, of course. The first part is for your, the claimant's, details. Where do you live? Um, at 1 Uranga Street, Durham. How do you spell Durham? D-U-R-H-A-M. Of course, I should know that. But it's just one of those names that sounds quite different from the way you spell it. It is confusing. I've seen it spelt with two R's. And what's the postcode for Durham? 4105. Good. And do you work? No, not at the moment. OK, so no work number. What about a home phone number? Yes, I can give you that. It's 7848-3762. 7848-3762. Right. Now, this part here is for the respondent's details. Who's the respondent? The individual person, company or business that you're claiming against. Is the claim against a landlord, tenant, trader or driver? Well, it's a company that sells home appliances. So, that's trader then. Just a moment while I write that down. ABC Appliances, actually. Oh, now, this part is really important. If the respondent is a company, you must have the company's full and correct name and registered address. I've looked it up on the Internet, and it's ABC Appliances Limited. Good. If we don't get this part absolutely right, you won't have a legal claim. And their registered address? Yes, I've got that written down here. Just a minute. It's, um, 17 Brown Avenue. That's in Baden, isn't it? I think I know the place. My wife bought a vacuum cleaner there last month. Yes, Baden. Have you got the postcode for Baden? It's really similar to mine. Wait a moment. I'd better make sure I get it right. 4065. That's it. And what's the telephone number for ABC Appliances? Oh, um... 72324681. Good. Got that. Now, in the third part of this form, we get to the actual goods or services that are in dispute. I assume you made a purchase from them. Yes, that's right. On the 3rd of February, 2011. And did the goods have any sort of guarantee or warranty? Yes, but only for six months. So it was just a six-month warranty? Yes, they offered me an extended warranty for three years. But I would have had to pay extra for that. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. 
You'll need to give a full description of the goods involved, the nature of the defect or fault, and any other relevant particulars. So, tell me, what did you buy? I bought a washing machine. Yes, but what brand, model, and serial number? The brand name was Mallard, and it was the Whisper model. Serial number, just a moment. I've got the warranty papers in my bag. Yes, here it is. Serial number XY303. Great. Now I need to know how much you agreed to pay. It cost a thousand pounds. Did you trade in your old machine? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Okay. Now, what were you given for the trade in? Two hundred fifty pounds. So, in actual fact, the purchase price you agreed on was seven hundred and fifty pounds. That's right. And they delivered the goods two days later, on the 5th of March, and picked up the trade in at the same time. Now, think carefully about this next question. What did the respondent say about the quality of the goods or the way they would perform? The salesman who served me at the appliance shop said, The Mallet Whisper model has a much shorter cycle, so it uses less power. Oh, and he added, And it will also use less water. Is that true? Well, partly. It does seem to use less water, but both the wash cycle and the rinse cycle go on for much longer than my old machine, so I don't see how it can use less electricity. But the sales assistant also said, This model is whisper quiet. And is it? No, not at all. It's so noisy we can't hear the television in the next room. Excuse me, I have to answer that. Would you mind waiting? I'll get back to you in a minute. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Dreamtime Tours have just the tour for you. The one I have chosen to talk to you about today is what I consider our best tour. It will take you from coast to mountain and back again. You'll spend a memorable and very comfortable day traveling in air conditioned luxury. You'll see from our brochure that we have four pickup stops along the coast. And about 20 minutes after we pick up our last passenger for the day, we'll be stopping off briefly at a magnificent housing development, marina, and shopping complex. You'll be able to admire some of the most expensive and lavish houses on the coast. And here we'll take a quick walk around the waterfront. Now, despite its name, Hope Island, we can reach it without getting our feet wet or Taking a boat ride. Hope Island is connected to the mainland by bridges. From there, we head inland to the beautiful Tambourine Mountain. You'll have time to browse in the many specialty shops, or you can sit and relax at a friendly outdoor cafe. We board the bus again and pass through an old timber milling town on our way to O'Reilly's Green Mountains. Once there, you might wish to venture across the famous treetop walk, which is a bridge suspended in the canopy of a rainforest, 
definitely not for the faint-hearted. If you're not up to the excitement of this walk, or perhaps after you've done it, why not enjoy lunch on the balcony of O'Reilly's Restaurant? Before we leave, you'll have time for a stroll through the botanical gardens, or perhaps you'd like to feed the beautiful parrots and other birds. We'll supply the bird seed. From O'Reilly's, we travel to an alpaca farm for a demonstration, and of course, there'll be a photo opportunity for you with these gorgeous animals before returning to the coach for the journey back to your original departure point. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. If I've persuaded any of you to sign up for this tour, take a look at our Dreamtime Tours brochure. You'll see that you can book over the telephone, or you can make reservations through the reception desk. We generally have a member of staff manning the desk from 7.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day of the week. Don't hesitate to ask reception staff any questions that you might have about this tour or any other tour, and be sure to make it known if you have any special needs. We'll do our best to make your trip rewarding and worthwhile. If this is the tour you want, be sure to specify Green Mountain Tour, and note that these excursions are full day tours on three days of the week only Sunday, Monday, and Friday, although we're hoping to have a Saturday tour available by next year. You'll see that fares are extremely reasonable, with each adult paying just $37. Now, that's not bad for a trip of around 280 kilometers, is it? If you want to bring the family, obviously, the family pass is great value at $94. That includes two adults and two children. But if you're an older adult, over 65, in other words, a senior citizen, your fare is discounted too. You'll pay a bit less than the full adult rate. Please note the departure times. We adhere to these strictly. The coach will leave the southernmost point of Kulangata at 10 to 8 sharp, travel through Burleigh, and on to Surfer's Paradise, which is our most popular pickup point departing from there at half past eight in the morning. At a quarter to nine, we make our last pickup at Labrador. May I remind you to dress appropriately for the day? Ladies, no high heels, please. Comfortable walking shoes are what is required, and I always recommend that everyone takes a light jacket, because the mountain air can be quite cool compared to the heat and humidity of the coastal regions. Oh, something else I should remind you of. The prices quoted in the brochure are just for coach travel. Although, we can arrange for a minibus to collect you from your accommodation and bring you to the departure point free of charge. If you want to avail yourself of this service, be sure to let the booking clerk know. You will need to bring along extra cash or a credit card to cover expenses such as optional side trips, food and drink, and... Of course, entrance fees to the various attractions. Well, that's all I have time to tell you. If you have further inquiries, please use the phone number on the brochure. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three.
Zoe goes to talk to her academic advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now, listen carefully to the conversation between Zoe and her advisor and answer questions 21 to 30. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet? Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet, but I really love the campus and I've already made a few friends. Fantastic. Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester, and, assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take Principles of Marketing or Introduction to International Trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right, well, marketing is a broad general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure. You could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing, Introduction to Economics, Banking and Finance, and, let's see, Principles of Financial Accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's OK, I think, but I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes, but nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our maths syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry and stuff, hardly any stats. Right, well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident, thanks. Hang on a minute, there's one more thing. You're English. Now, you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah. Now I'm in an English-speaking environment and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly. To get the information and ideas, you need to write your essays. That means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material if you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover. That's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. Sometimes these will be from a transparency, because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever, at least 350,000 words. Even Winston Churchill only knew 60,000, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the Academic Word List by Avril Coxhead of Victoria University. That's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied Word Lists, of course, but how does this one help? The Academic Word List is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. 
It contains 570 families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. Well, that's apart from the 2,000 most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms of a word are listed together. So you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words, so it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. You can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway, as I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment, take a sheet of paper and write four headings. Words I can use, words I can recognise but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi, Mr. Smith. I wonder whether you can spare several minutes with me. Sure. What's your name, please? John Murray. Good, John. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I am a freshman in the communication faculty. I quite enjoy the life here, except for the difficulty I have in the lectures. You know, I find it difficult to take notes when I listen. If I take notes on my notebook, I can't concentrate on the lecture. But I feel frustrated after the lecture if I don't write down anything. As we know, note-taking is a complex activity, which requires a high level of ability in many separate skills. At least four important skills are needed. Four? I don't expect so many! I think that needs one or two skills. Firstly, you have to understand what the lecturer says as he says it. That means you should try to develop the ability to infer the meaning of unfamiliar words from the context. You cannot stop the lecture in order to look up a new word or check an unfamiliar sentence pattern. Yes, that puts the non-native speaker like me under a particular severe strain. Often I may not be able to recognise words in speech, which I understand straight away in print. So the ability of inferring is important. Of course, you won't always be able to do this successfully. You must not allow failure of this kind to discourage you, however. It's often possible to understand much of a lecture by concentrating solely on those points which are most important. But how do I decide what's important? Well, that's in itself another skill I'd like to tell you. At first, the most important piece of information in a lecture is the title itself. 
If this is printed or referred to beforehand, you should study it carefully and make sure you're in no doubt about its meaning. A title often implies many of the major points that will later be covered in the lecture itself. It should help you therefore to decide what the main point of the lecture will be. Besides the title, what should I pay attention to during the speech? A good lecturer often signals what's important or unimportant. He may give direct or indirect signals. Many lecturers, for example, explicitly tell their audience that a point is important and that the student should write it down. Unfortunately, some lecturers who are trying to establish a friendly relationship with the audience are likely on these occasions to employ a colloquial style. He might say such thing as, This is, of course, the crunch, or perhaps you'd like to get it down. Although this will help the student who's a native English speaker, it may very well cause difficulty for the non-native speaker. You'll therefore have to make a big effort to get used to the various styles of his lectures. I see. You mean I should get used to some colloquial expressions of the lecturer and write down the points he recommends us to take? That's right. And it's worth remembering that most lecturers also give indirect signals to indicate what's important. They either pause or speak slowly or speak loudly or use a greater range of intonation. Or they employ a combination of these devices when they say something important. So I should be aware of this and focus my attention accordingly. If I can catch the main points, how can I write them quickly and clearly? Good question. That's a problem that most students find hard to solve. Having sorted out the main points, you have to write them down. In order to write at speed, you may find it helps to abbreviate. You can also try to select only those words which give maximum information. There are usually nouns, but sometimes verbs or adjectives. Writing only one point on each line also helps you to understand your notes when you come to read them later. I see! The last but not least skill to learn is to show the connections between the various points you've noted. This can often be done more effectively by a visual presentation than by a lengthy statement in words. Thus, the use of spacing, of underlining, and of conventional symbols plays an important part in efficient note-taking. In this way, you can see at a glance the framework of the lecture. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. I think I'll employ the methods in the next lecture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.